Questions to the Cabinet members will now be taken. Uh, question number 12, Am Councillor Ambash. Uh, question number 12 to the Cabinet member, please. Thank you, Councillor Ambash. Um, perhaps I can just cast your mind back to the 9th of February when you were at the OSC. Actually, I wasn't there, but um, you were there. And um, I think, you, I'm sure you'll remember, recall now that actually it was agreed, and there was no dissent to that, that um, agreement, that, um, and I can read out the actual um, paragraph H, the executive is recommended to authorise the seeking of approval of the shortlist of contractors by the Director of Finance, as indicated in paragraph 30, with the award of the contract to be made using the SO 83A procedure. So um, that is quite clear. There's also, um, you make a point that it's not, that it's just me making that decision. That's not right. I mean, I obviously take advice from the, the um, directors, director of resources, director of children's services, director of public health. So it's not me just on my own making these decisions. And then um, you also make a point about the, the new school nursing contract, which we still haven't um, come to conclusion on. And the health visiting the health visiting contract is in the process of being mobilised, so I'm sure when that will come to the OSC to be scrutinised for further detail. Can I thank the Cabinet Member for her answer? Uh, no, I wasn't saying she didn't have advice from officers. I said she was the sole member making the decision. But I do think in her written answer it's a pretty weak ploy to attack the questioner. I haven't forgotten what happened on the February OSC when we all made, in my view, a poor decision about the contract. And I, from my point of view, have changed my mind since February. Theresa May has changed her mind many times on many things since February, remember. I feel that the cabinet member might reflect on a huge decision to award an important health visiting contract, 35 million over five years. What is the point of the Education and Children's OFC if not to scrutinize a huge cabinet member's decision before she makes it in awarding a large contract that will affect services to thousands of children and thousands of families. Thank you, Councillor Ambash. Um, well, I really just go back to what I said before. I mean, it's, it, you may have changed your mind, but the Council hasn't changed its mind. It went to the Executive, and this was all agreed. And um, it, isn't, it's not, it went to the Executive. That's the, mem that's the members, the other members, the members of the Executive who agreed it. So it's not just me on my own. And as I say, the next, when we get to the next contract, which is the school nursing and the health visiting, that I'm sure will be back for you to scrutinise. Councillor Dawson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, second supplemental. Um, as I was actually in the chair of the OSC, I'm very glad that Councillor Ambash recalls the events of that evening so well. Um, I would also point out and ask the Cabinet Member whether um, she could also confirm, as it said in that report, that the tender specification in draft form was in the Member's room. And um, I think an assiduous councillor such as Councillor Ambash, I'm sure, had scoured through those, um, that, that draft. And therefore, we had perfect opportunity to raise any issues or any concerns or even take a slightly different decision than we did do on that evening. So I think trying to retroactively change all the processes that we have very carefully gone through, would you agree with me that that really is no way to run a council? Thank you, Councillor Dawson. Yes, I absolutely agree. And um, perhaps it's as a reminder to all of us that we do have that chance to look in great detail at contracts and specifications, and perhaps we should take up that offer more often. Thank you. Question 13, Councillor Cooper. Question 13 to the Cabinet Member for Housing. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. Um, firstly, I'd like to just recognise the role of the private rented sector in providing and meeting housing demand um, and allowing many households to have choice and flexibility. The sector is changing and adapting, and a prime example of this is um, London and Quadrant providing over 100 private rent homes in the Navoa area, Battersea, in Nine Elms. Sorry. Um, I welcome additional regulation in the sector. The government has Im input it to tackle poor management, which fortunately for us in the borough is the, uh, the minority, a very small minority, of our landlords. To answer her question, prior to deregulation in 1989, the sector had slumped to a very small amount, only 10% of the residential stock was available for renting, compared to 45% in the 1960s. The deregulation actually increased the stock that was available, but it also improved the quality and condition of stock. 
I think a declining private rental sector will only serve to make tenants worse off. I think Shelter recognised this in their report. Um, and a rental cap will inevitably push landlords to spend less on their stock or to come out of the rented market altogether. So for the majority, the choice and quality that the private rental sector provides cannot be jeopardised by an arbitrary rent cap. And for the minority of tenants, we in Wandsworth continue to work through our private sector management housing team to um, address the poor living conditions and to stamp them out. So. Would the Cabinet member concur with the Shelter Commission study published in 2015 that hard rent controls will harm the private rented sector? Yes, I absolutely do concur with the Shelter um, study. Uh, they estimated, I believe, that about a third, just under a third, of landlords would seek to sell or to withdraw from the property um, market altogether and to stop renting out their property. I think a declining supply would be very harmful for us. Um, additionally, I think the rent caps, as I've previously mentioned, will result in a, a market where less and less is being spent on improving property services. So I would fully agree with the, um, with the shelter study. Uh, second supplementary. Oh. I bow. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Would, would the cabinet member accept that uh, an alternative reason for the increase in the private sector since that particular date is in fact the very large number of ex-council houses that have been sold into private landlordism. It's something like uh, 7,000 in this ward alone, run by small uh, resident, uh, uh, landlord empires, very famously on the Autumn Estate, but also on the Doddington. It's actually got very little to do with rent control. It's about the public sector skipping out of its responsibilities to the extent that even Mrs. May and the CBI are saying quite loudly that we have to do something about boosting the social rented sector. The growth in private sector rent is nothing to do with rent decontrol. It's because you've solved off so many properties that are actually moved into that sector. Um, no, you won't be surprised that I disagree with that analysis of the situation. Um, I think that when the rent controls are taken away, it encourages more people into the sector. Some of that will come from bought social housing because the policy happened at the same time. The rest of it, it's not all, that increase is not all from social housing, it's from different sectors. So no, I, th I think that you're drawing a parallel and a conclusion that's not really supported by the evidence. Question 14, Councillor Pritchard. Uh, question 14. Thank you very much for that. I thank Councillor Kutchard for her, her question. And I'm going to deal with the last part of the question first, as I think it, it's quite important. She can absolutely rest assured that there is not, there never has been, and I hope will never will be, any intention of moving disabled people from homes that they love and are supported in by their families from any supported housing scheme that we have. And yes, families will be consulted if we ask them to move. The CARE Act of 2014 is very clear on this issue and the fact that care must be taken into, a, into personal account with their families and the people and not just you know, a blueprint for the whole thing. It's long been recognized that there is an increased risk to vulnerable adults whose care arrangements are complicated by cross-boundary considerations and distance. Now, some of the people that we do have in other boroughs are actually in neighboring boroughs, and that's fine because their, their, their support network is ill there. But some of them are quite far away. And today I called down the figures because I, was, I wanted to know what we were talking about, and they're not actually in the answer. Out of borough with learning difficulties, we have 258 um, adults, which I think is quite a lot, and with mental health, 72. If we look at in borough, learning difficulties 13 and mental health 43. So we've got a hell of a job to move some of these people back and nearer to their communities. I think on a positive note, we are building housing for people, um, supported housing for people with disabilities, and that is also mentioned in, in the uh, answer. But it's not enough, I agree with that, and I think that we should do more to make sure that all our vulnerable people are supported.
sorry, I did. So, right, that better? Can you hear me? Excellent. Uh, I'm very relieved that Councillor Sutters has been able to reassure me and also I know that there are people out there who will be reassured by the statement that people will not be moved. Um, as the numbers didn't come in uh, for the, in the answer, I'm very interested in having them published properly. What I'd also say is that I would think it, this is a, um, sorry, would Councillor Sutter's agree that we should have detailed monitoring of all the cases, so that's going to be quite a lot with 270, 258, all of the cases to absolutely make sure that all the residents and their families are happy with the changes and that any issues can be discovered before any move takes place. So I'm suggesting a monitoring scheme to make sure that everything runs smoothly. Well, um, I thank Councillor Critchard for her um, supplemental question. It would be presumptuous of me in the absence of the, the Cabinet member to agree to that, although to me it sounds quite a sensible idea. I would have to see what the detail was and I will have to approach him and come back to you. Second supplemental, Mr Mayor. Um, would the Cabinet member agree with me that this is very much the new supported housing schemes that are proposed very much in the spirit of supporting vulnerable adults within the communities with which they wish to live if they wish to return to the borough, but equally to note that if there isn't the requirement to fill those spaces from these individuals that they will be offered to young adults with learning disabilities who are approaching 18 and comment on that. I thank Councillor Lewis for his uh, supplemental. Um, I'm actually very proud of our record on supporting uh, people with disabilities and vulnerable adults, and yes, I agree with everything he said there. Question uh, 15, Councillor Easter. Uh, thank you very much to Councillor Heaster for that very important question. Uh, the answer is that it's only thanks to the Council's negotiations that we were able to ensure Battersea Power Station continues <coughs> to provide affordable housing in the face of their £750 million cost increase. And during the negotiations, we pushed the power station to make three concessions. The first one was we forced them to accept a lower profit on the scheme. The second one was we brought forward affordable homes by three years so because we know that Londoners need homes now. And finally, we agreed that we would jointly retain the aim of increasing affordable housing again up to 33%. But, but I think uh, what Councillor Heaster is also asking is if we told the GLA of the situation with the power station on the 10th of April, why did the Mayor of London wait until the day before our decision, two months later, to write and object? And if he really objected, why did his team, after our decision, decide to accept it? I think we both know the answer. Labour and the Mayor know that we did the right thing on Battersea Power Station. They were playing political games at the expense of our residents. Second supplementary question, Mr Mayor. Um, I'm, it, it would appear to me, uh, Mr. Mayor, oh, sorry, Mr. Um, Chairman, that uh, you agree entirely with me that this is a bit of mischief making uh, by the Labour Party. There was no other decision really which the Council could make. We, the, council, uh, the Council had independent advice about this. Um, its officers were uh, convinced this was right. GLA op officers had an opportunity to comment and decided to say nothing, except, of course, when Sadiq Khan became Mayor, he decided to have a look at it again and started the mischief making which is so 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 apparent with that particular individual so would you agree with me mr uh, 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 chairman um, that this is all really a bit of a sham uh, created by the labor party for some electoral gain somewhere in battersea i suppose but councillor Heaster, thank you very much uh, i i entirely agree with you this has been a political game all along we know that the mayor of london allowed our neighboring borough merton to permit a scheme with 9% affordable housing. It's been a political game for him. And yes, there has been a petition that had a number of, of signatories. And we need to listen to people that London does need more homes. We all agree with that. That's why Wandsworth has an unrivaled record on providing homes. 
In Nine Elms, we're providing 27% affordable housing on two schemes right next to Battersea Power Station. Battersea Power Station is a unique site, and the, the Mayor has been playing games with the lives of local people. Second supplementary. Councillor Carpenter. Put it on. Uh, well, would the, would the councillor uh, agree that uh, viability depends on how you do the sums? Now, the way that uh, Wandsworth does its sums is it takes the inflated land value put forward by the property developer, it adds the cost of the build, it adds the profit on the cost of the build, and the balance is what's left for affordable homes. The way it should do the sums, it should take the cost of the build, it should add the profit, it should add the cost of meeting the planning obligations, which include the appropriate amount of affordable housing, and the balancing figure is the value of the land. The value of the land is entirely dependent on planning gain. If you reduce the planning gain, that value goes down and you get your affordable housing. Does it not, you not agree that is a better way of doing it? Uh, thank you, Councillor Carpenter. I, I totally disagree. If, if the cal <laughs> if, if the cal if the calculations were done that way, we wouldn't have any affordable housing at all. No planning development would happen in Wandsworth if we did the calculations that way. The, Im the important thing about viability assessments, the important thing about them, is that they're independently assessed. You're absolutely not right to say that Wandsworth does the calculations. We make sure they're checked by a third party and that's why we're confident that we got the maximum affordable housing we could possibly have got on the power station, as elsewhere. I mean, to give you another example, we got 36% affordable housing on a scheme in Thamesfield Ward recently. We always make sure we get the best we can. Thank you. The time for questions to Cabinet members being um, up.